Hey everybody and welcome to episode 11 of Facts on the Ground. My name is Misty Winston and I'm here with my co-host and partner in crime, Jesse Zerl. And today I'm really excited. We have a very special guest, um, somebody I consider a good friend. Um, he's also the co-host of the Action for Assange live stream, the host of Slow News Day, um, the public re uh, relations liaison for Anonymous, an activist, an analyst, and a nickname Ninja. Uh, please welcome Steve Poikin into our show. Steve, thank you so much for joining us today. Hell yeah, dude. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to have you here. Yeah, been, thank you uh, for joining us, Steve. Been, uh, uh, this is what, take five now? I don't know. <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think after, it's four. Um, a serious amount of technical difficulties. Yeah. <laughs> it's like technical difficulties and a power outage and a partridge and a pear tree. But we finally, hopefully this one will work out okay. I believe so. I, and, and that's because Sleepy Josh is here. I have, I'm very uh, thank you, Josh. happy for that, too. <laughs> yeah. Yay, Sleepy. <laughs> I'm a much more confident broadcaster in my own right when Sleepy Josh is here. I hear you. He's not a tech idiot. <laughs> I'm fucking tech dumb. <laughs> He's very patient with ignorance, too, which she like I'm not even that like that pretty of a face, so like I, don't, I got nothing going for me on this one. It's just the the sheer sheer kindness of individuals. That's the only thing that, that makes it work. I hear. It. <laughs> so before we get started, I had a couple people on. Well, I guess we're kind of getting started, but I had a couple people on Twitter ask me um, to ask you kind of how you got into activism and uh, kind of like, I guess just like your backstory, like what what kind of got you active in the Assange movement and all of those things. Like people just kind of, I don't know if a lot of people know like um, sort of a lot about where you come from and you have this crazy history of like amazing stories. So, I mean, keep it brief because I know you could talk for like five hours days and about- Hours you know. and hours. So uh, <laughs> yeah. in the, the early nineties, I grew up in Indiana. Uh, and in the early 90s, I went down to Indianapolis for a free Mumia protest. That was my first experience with ever being at a real protest. Uh, in 1999, I uh, had found myself on the West Coast. It was right when the WTO protests were getting ready to happen. So I went up to Seattle for that. It was the first time that I'd gotten my head split open by the police at a protest, uh, which apparently is supposed to make you stop going to them. But I got hit in the head so hard that I decided to make it a vocation. Um, so, uh, yeah, any, any way that I can agitate, I have been for about uh, a little over 20 years now. And uh, last year, uh, Andrew Smith, who uh, is our co-host on the vigils, reached out to me and asked me if, uh, if I would like to be a part of picking up where Unity for J had left off. Because Unity for J wrapped in oh, late May or early June of last year. Um, and there was kind of like an empty space in the internet for people who were advocating for Julian Assange in the the online space. So we started doing the vigils. Uh, we're in our 55th consecutive week. And, uh, and we did, you know, you know, Misty, but the people watching may not, we were able to successfully crowdfund to get to Washington DC in February to hold demonstrations during the first round of the the show trial of Julian Assange. We're going back in September. Uh, those start September 7th. Our first event will be uh, Saturday, September 5th. Uh, and assuming everything goes well and we're, you know, allowed to travel, A, B, won't have to quarantine for two weeks when we land and, you know, all that kind of crazy shit. Um, so we should be looking at some, uh, some incredibly well put together and well pulled off, uh, events in DC in September, 
in the interim there though between like 1999 and 2019 um for a while i briefly worked for the nation uh i was part of their 2008 election blog team which i'm pretty sure was the first time that people re were really sending uh sending the internet as it were to go cover campaigns um i had uh, i started out uh wanting to write about mike gravel because i thought he was interesting and uh was definitely like a little bit more in line with where my my personal politics were although he wasn't ready to burn down the entire system um he was at least like one of the most sane voices on that debate stage which was short-lived both gravel and kucinich were gone by iowa um i started looking into john edwards and writing about him a little bit found out that he was just a horrific person uh started to study up and learn more about barack obama um and my entire career in like mainstream media came to a screaming end when i tried to have the nation publish an article that i wrote called barack obama reagan with a tan um they were not pleased uh <clears throat> the politics editor at the nation at the time was a seven foot tall opie tailored looking motherfucker named chris hayes and he uh he didn't so much fire me as he invited me to be successful elsewhere and then made sure that i would never be successful elsewhere uh everything that i wrote for the nation has been scrubbed off of the interwebs um outlets that i would go to work for afterwards within like six or eight months would be bought up by some other company and then like we would all be fired i'm not blaming that entirely on the one piece that i wrote for for the nation that was happening all over the place but uh but yeah that's uh so chris, Hay that's chris chris hayes effectively canceled you to a certain extent yeah absolutely <laughs> absolutely um, That's an amazing point of privilege that you have there, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. a bragging point, man. I like that. <laughs> and it's ironic because he's of the same ilk of uh, people who are whining about uh, the threat of so-called cancel culture. Uh, yeah. These are all people. These are all people, more or less, who have canceled not just other people, but as. Um, I think Max pointed out on the gray zone, whole countries, people like David Frum, who advocated for uh, the war on Iraq that's still happening. Uh, you know, these are people whining because they're afraid that um, they're finally getting questioned by uh, outlets that are way out of the orbit of mainstream media. Yeah, and they're scared. And the, the reaction, at least in the digital space, to fear is almost always censorship. Absolutely. We're seeing it again now with Q, which, listen, Q is a hot mess. It's, you know, whatever. But to, to just ban all of the Q accounts and just not that you're, you're just confirming all their bullshit for them. Right. Really. I mean, it's um, censorship is never going to be the answer. It's just not. It's, it's, and I'm, I mean, I'm sure that you guys feel the same way, but seeing people on the left cheer it on is incredibly frustrating. Mm -hmm. I I can't stand it. And it's like these fucking lemmings haven't learned shit in <laughs> two years. Every single one of the the little fucking morons with the Rose Twitter, like Rose Twitter, <laughs> they all watched Lee Camp go through uh web page after web page after web page uh of pro-palestinian voices voices inside uh iran a ton of left-leaning outlets that all got the axe when uh, alex jones was deplatformed and all of those people who watched lee camp do that went okay well glad that's out of the way and it'll never have to happen again and we're just going to collectively forget about it now. It, yeah, and it's incredible because it's not like we don't have historical precedents for this. It's not like we don't have things to look at in the past. It's like, hey, this is not a great idea. Um, I mean, Noam Chomsky has been talking about this shit for decades. And 
the fact that we're still, well, not we, but the fact that there are still people out there proclaiming to be of the left who think that censorship is ever going to not come back on them is unbelievably annoying. It's, I mean, talk about shooting yourself in the foot. It's a, a naivety that you only get from privileged individuals. Chomsky is one of the signatories to that Harper's letter, by the way. <laughs> Yeah, no, he absolutely is, um, which is, I mean, listen, Chomsky's not like the, I, I don't know why people always, um, you know, try to um, put him up on some pedestal. Dude's a genius, like, he's amazing, he was instrumental in my radicalization, like, he, he's great, he, like, he's great, but he's not, that doesn't mean he's infallible, like, he's, mm -hmm. he's not always right, he's wrong about Joe Biden, he's, I mean, that's, it's okay to criticize Noam Chomsky, and the only reason I bring him up is because you know, just bringing up the fact that we do have, like, it's not like we haven't had this discussion before a million times, and it's not like it hasn't always been a very bad idea. You know, like, mm -hmm. it, that's well, always... And Chomsky, like, you know, we were talking a little bit about Cornell West before we went live. Um, Chomsky and Cornell West and, and a number of other people on, you know, the, the left have this institutional security that you and I are never going to know, you know, although I hope maybe we do someday, but not because it'll make us tone deaf, but because, you know, it's nice to not worry about whether you're going to buy your kid's shoes or some groceries this week. Um, but that institutional security coupled with the, the bubble of academia creates this sort of this just undeniable disconnect from the the pulse of regular everyday working people if all you are seeing are students who more it really more does more and it's like it, it, that's it's kind of what i think is frustrating to me about like the regular everyday people who are cheering it on because they don't have that institutional security and they're cheering on their own demise and it's i don't know if they're just too ignorant to understand it or if they're um you know just um kidding themselves or i don't know what it is but it's re and it's so people you forget go ahead we we forget a lot or at least i do i forget a lot that on that political compass that this entire line up represents the authoritarian axis and the entire line below represents the libertarian axis and that's split right and left but that doesn't mean that there aren't a fuck ton of authoritarian leftists and yeah. there the um the DSA specifically, and look, Matt Stoller's a douche. There's no arguing that. But when he called the DSA progressives frightened authoritarian children, he was right. And, and I have, I have witnessed this firsthand in dealing with with people from DSA. I have witnessed this. I've experienced it firsthand in trying to talk to people, both in the digital space and in real life who uh, will brand themselves like, you know, hardcore progressives and I'm lefter than you and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, okay, but where do you stand in terms of civil liberties? And mm -hmm. the DSA as an institution and the people who have gone on to have careers in media kind of out of that DSA type progressive sort of genre uh are very very thin on the ground when it comes to digital privacy rights individual privacy rights civil liberties in general uh and i don't i don't know if it's because they never talk about it or because they're just wired to be authoritarian and it seems excessive to them for people to have uh an abundance of civil liberties i don't know i, I don't have an answer for that one yeah, I think it's likely a combination of both uh, in in some proportion. Um, one feeds the other, feeds the other, and round and round it goes. And I think it's important to talk about that cancel culture um, kerfuffle, if you even want to give it uh, the seriousness of that term. 
I'm here um, all day as long as you say kerfuffle again. Dude, I was just, <laughs> just like, did he just say kerfuffle? That's amazing. Kerfuffle. <laughs> Good job, Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, but that's basically what it amounted to. It was, um, it's, it's an argument among elite liberals, uh, but it's also meant, I think, as a piece of propaganda to um, make, uh, you know, those people who might be questioning voices like George Packer, for example, or Noam Chomsky, for example, or Barry Weiss, as another uh, hideous example, um, make them afraid to do that, make them afraid to do what we're trying to do with this podcast uh, to provide alter alternative sources of information that uh, don't pull punches. And I think that's, you know, that's what a lot of the signatories to this letter are afraid of. And I think that in that sense, it serves as, as a piece of propaganda insofar as Harper's audience goes and, and, you know, uh, how many people are exposed to it on Twitter. But, um, I certainly look at it as a piece of elite liberal propaganda. Oh, I, without a doubt, without a doubt, it, it's, uh, several, you know, a couple hundred words worth of the grownups know how to do this. You need to go over there and sit down, pay attention to what we say. If we ask for it, send us money. But we've got this handled and and you guys just, you know, you guys just stay over there. That's what mm -hmm. it's like to me. What was sort yeah. of, you know, sneering down the end of your your spectacles at you know, the the great unwashed. Yeah, I agree. And so, that's, really, that's the crux of the problem with uh, with social media in general, is that it went from absolute chaos back in the day to what it is now, which is basically a news aggregator that has different, almost impermeable bubbles swirling around the news aggregator. And you're, you're allowed to communicate within your bubble, you know, and, and well, depending yeah, on what it is. That's something that Chomsky's been telling us. Like, they, they define the parameters that the discussions, allow, you, you can talk about these things, but if you step outside, you can't, that's it. This is where you're allowed to stay. And social media has done a brilliant job at enforcing that. It, and, that's exactly what it does. And they can do it by algorithm now. The recent hack of Twitter that happened a week or so ago showed the world that, yes, there's a God mode feature on Twitter that appears to have a, a backdoor directly to intelligence. And you've got quite literal internet sensors, both employed by Twitter and employed by intelligence agencies whose sole job it is is to make sure that what you're saying doesn't break out of your bubble. I, I fucking, Orwell was a pussy. That's what I'm getting at. Yeah, that's exactly What's what it that? does. Too. What? Uh -huh. what was that? What did you say, Steve? I said Orwell was a pussy. Yeah. Orwell was a <laughs> pussy. He had limited vision. He did not see this shit coming. Not right? at it all. Is, no. but, it's Orwell on steroids. Like, people keep bringing up Orwell. Danny Sherson was on, on my show. Yeah, I watched that. It was good. Danny so, I think has, has made the point, and I'm pretty sure it was on my show, although it could have been on the vigil. But uh, he said that what we're living in right now is more, more Aldous Huxley than George Orwell. Yeah. And, and the reason that he said that is because uh, they're the the people in Brave New World um, weren't aware of just how heavily they had been they were being monitored and censored and surveilled. Whereas in 1984, you knew it like going in, 
and mm. and I, as as much as government surveillance and internet censorship is in our faces, I don't think it's in the face uh, of like the people that you would just run into in the grocery store. I don't think that they've been made aware of just how dystopic it's become. Dystopian? I don't know if dystopic is a word. I'm sorry. It, well, it di- dystopian, though. Dystopian <laughs> works. <laughs> but seriously, though, that, that just loops back around to the media, though, because the reason why those people are ill-informed or uninformed is because the media doesn't talk about it. So it's, you know, the average person you meet in the grocery store who watches, you know, 30 minutes of MSNBC every day and thinks they're educated, they have no idea because you're not going to hear about that on MSNBC. You're not, there is no... There is no access to that information unless you dig for it. I mean, you have to really put an effort to find information these days. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, shit. There was a point to where interdepartmental memos were coming through the U.S. government saying, you cannot go to WikiLeaks from this computer. You cannot look at WikiLeaks on this computer. I think it was I think it was either Saliza or Cuomo, but one Cuomo. of those was it Cuomo? It was like it's illegal <laughs> to go to look at WikiLeaks. Like what a turd. <laughs> He's such a turd. Fredo. Uh, oh. He really is. Did Chris Cuomo really say that? Yeah. He really did. He went on air and he said that. You know, you should just depend on. Uh, we'll give you the information because it's illegal for you to actually look at the WikiLeaks inf- the, the the releases. You, that's illegal because they're private emails and you can't look at them. Uh, went on air co- and said that out loud. I'll I'll send you but the clip. Not, no worries. They're not private anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that ship has sailed, my friend. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's it, so. It it's kind of crazy how. Um, how oh and it's it's so um intimidating because it's really i have no idea how to break through that that wall you know to get to get um you know people more informed it's it's really difficult right now it's going to it's it's going to get worse before it gets better that that's my i i don't really make predictions but there aren't enough people in the digital space who are screaming their heads off about this and hardly any of them have blue checks you know when um when we successfully defeated sopa and pippa and uh it was six seven years ago now um it was because sites like reddit and even google and a number of other large uh you know steve just for our just for our viewers who don't know can you um explain what sopa and pippa were yeah so sopa stands for the stop online piracy act and it was something that um that came through i'm gonna get a year for you here real quick um basically if you can be it's 2012 if you can put yourself back almost 10 years to when um things like uh file sharing services like napster were around and uh limewire and fucking uh uh you know I, all of the all of the the file sharing sites when those were around and proliferating uh people who um people who were opposed to that who wanted you know copyrights on everything and wanted to make sure that not the artist mind but the company who distributed the content got paid for this work they flipped out they got some they had some congress critters in their pocket they drafted this legislation called the Stop Online Privacy Act. And it was, it's been described by basically everyone who, uh, who was involved in online, online rights uh, as, as taking a hammer to a problem that required a scalpel. Uh, it was it, it basically would have criminalized even the non-pirated sharing of other artists' work. 
It was ridiculous. Mm. Uh, the uh, Pippa was, uh, I think, protect internet providers. Think that think, think that's the acronym. It's been a long time since I've had to look at it. Cer certainly wasn't privacy. Uh, no, no, it was not. <laughs> uh, and Pippa was one of those things that was going to kill end-to-end -end encryption back in 2012. Now we've got uh, at the same time there was a bill going through the EU called ACTA, which was companion legislation uh, that would have done the exact same thing. We've got uh, now the Earn It or the Earn IT Act, which is once again trying to kill end-to-end -end encryption, although nowhere in the bill is the word encryption ever mentioned. It's they're trying to to save us from ourselves because, you know, the children is straight up the excuse. Well, there might be people sharing online pornography or child pornography. And this is what uh, uh, the... Uh, the people who sat down to do the two episodes of Julian Assange's show that became the book Cypherpunks, uh, it's one of the child porn is one of the things that they call the four horsemen of the info apocalypse. And it basically mm -hmm. means that there are like four specific subjects that uh, if you bring them up, then your your uh, as the government, if you bring up any of these four subjects, uh, terrorism, kitty porn, um, going to blank on the other two until we're about halfway through this interview, and then I'll just shout them out randomly. It doesn't matter what we're talking. I'll be like, oh, yeah! Uh, <laughs> no holds anyway, barred. No holds you barred. You use those to leverage uh, the, the inherent disgust and fear of these things in everyone to get them to give up their rights. Uh, so it, it's, it's one of those things where like I'll fucking, I'll go do time because I beat a child molester. Like I don't have a problem doing that, but I'm going to scream my head off if you try to censor the entire internet just because there are sick individuals out there that are using this technology to share fucking kitty porn. Yeah, and logically, and I think pretty obviously, outlawing encryption in general is not going to prevent pedophiles from doing what they do. The, the problem is not encryption on the internet. Uh, you know, that this is a separate conversation to go into, but the problems are uh, far wider and deeper than uh, internet encryption. Well, and pedophilia existed before the internet, and it's going to exist forever that's i mean that's just the way it is it's a nasty mm -hmm. unfortunate and disgusting part of humanity that's just i mean censoring the internet isn't gonna it's like oh is censoring the internet gonna cure racism it's you know what i mean like there's that whole meme about oh is it gonna cure racism it's the same thing like it's you mm -hmm. can't censor you can't censor your way out of that stuff it just doesn't work um it, it's just a really unfortunate part of humanity it sucks but that's just the reality of it and Basically, everything that that makes up the four horsemen of the info apocalypse uh, is stuff that we're not really allowed to talk about anyway. You know, look how quickly they found other shit to talk about when Epstein got hemmed up. Look how quickly mm -hmm. mainstream media has walked away from covering Ghislaine Maxwell. Look how they won't touch the Maxwell family. If we didn't have Whitney Webb right now, we would be sorely more ignorant. Um, and mm -hmm. the second part of Whitney's series on the Maxwell family is uh, set to come out tomorrow sometime. It's already up on her Patreon. Patreon. Yeah, she's amazing. And um, right on. You're absolutely right too. And that's something else I wanted to ask you about. And I we, we've talked about it. You know probably in one of the other attempted times we've <laughs> tried to talk. Um, but just the mainstream media sucks. We all, I mean, we all know that. Um, but something that has been frustrating me and I think that is not getting talked about enough um, or at all is the sorry state of independent media. Um, 
there's uh, there's a real and especially just you know because you and I are both very active in the Assange movement. Um, there's a very um, obvious hesitation or um, refusal or fear to talk about Epstein or Julian Assange. It's like there are these third rail issues that you know I I don't expect mainstream media to cover because they're mainstream media. But I thought that the whole point of independent media was to cover these things that aren't getting talked about. And that's not happening. And um, at least, uh, obviously, it is to some degree. There are people like Whitney Webb. There's, you know, Slow News Day. There's Action for Assange. There's Elizabeth Foss. There's Caitlin Johnstone. Um, there are people doing it. But um, it seems like the bigger names in lefty independent media um, refuse to touch these issues. And I don't think that people are talking about that enough because maybe it's the whole hero worship thing. Oh, I love so-and-so and they can do no wrong. But it's a really frustrating thing because if we um, want to uh, you know, fight for any other issue that we care about, information is important. And when the people who are supposed to be informing us are you know, only you know, catering to our biases, where does that leave us? And so like kind of what do you think about that? Like what what do you see independent media like what kind of force do you see it being in the future? Man, I really right. want to be positive here. I really <laughs> I know. Um, what we have right now, what what we have right now is uh, in an in independent media um almost entirely based off of the Young Turks business model. And that goes for the right wingers too. It, it does. Where and, and that even that the Young Turks model is based off the Daily Show model, where you roll a clip, you make fun of the people talking, you wag your finger at it, and then you move immediately to the next clip. Mm -hmm. And all you're doing is using mainstream media as the baseline for your content. Um, I, 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 from the moment that I started doing Slow News Day, I made it a point and I told the audience right up front, I'm not going to do this. This is not going to be the show. There are, mm -hmm. you know, tons of people out there that have clip shows that are pretty good at what they do. If, if I was a little bit more soulless, I would do that. And I would do it better than them because I'm fucking funnier than most of them are. Uh, but that's like I intentionally wanted to create a show that um, used mainstream sources as little as possible. Hopefully never. It was always my intention to go out and find the, the independent journalists who were writing about the stuff that I wanted to talk about. Because you're right, hardly it's it's very rarely covered in mainstream media. When it is, it's spun so fucking hard that you don't even know what you're listening to anymore. Might as well be a commercial for whatever pharmaceutical they're about to er, air a commercial for. Um, so I always I, I've always tried to to have the conversations that I have with the people who wrote the stuff if I can, and if I can't then uh, at least use that material as my baseline for, for my content. But um, what the Young Turks did, and really what the Daily Show did, and if you look at uh, you know Dave Rubin's show, it's the exact same. Um, it, it is political porn to confirm your biases, to make everybody but your team look bad, and then to offer like next to no solutions outside of, well, you can vote, you know, you can donate to this fucking super PAC that I just started that wants to keep money out of politics. You can do that. You know, <laughs> like, are you fucking kidding me? Uh, For whom are we supposed to vote? Right. Right. <laughs> But guys, you can sign a petition. There's petitions. Sign a petition. Come on. It's ridiculous. 
and, and that's I mean, and that's the other thing too. Like I've had members of the Green or former members of the Green Party on Slow News Day here recently, but not because I was trying to pimp their campaign, because the Green Party is a corrupt fucking cesspool, and and it's not the fault of the people that have come on the show to talk about it. Um, it but I I've had a couple of candidates on, dude, and I've just felt dirty afterwards. You know, because, yeah, they're third party candidates. They might espouse political views that are more in line with the ones that I have. But at the end of it, I'm I know they're not going to win. And so it just feels like I'm fundraising for them and I feel gross as a result. Well, you're, not, you're not a horse race guy anyway. I mean, I know that they're third party candidates or whatever. And that's that's kind of the same way that Jesse and I want to approach this show is that we don't want that's there are plenty of people talking about joe biden and whatever dumb thing trump said and you know however weak bernie sanders is being today there's plenty of people doing that there's no need for another show like that there are so many issues not being talked about seriously important issues <laughs> not yeah, being and i give you guys a lot of credit for highlighting the ones that you've chosen to highlight this early on in your show and, <laughs> and the reason that i want you guys on slow news day this sunday it is because I don't cover half the shit that you are. So, okay, so. <laughs> I would like my audience to find a home where they right? can, you know, go go and, here's, and see here's this. A funny little story. When we first started talking, like our first little meeting that we had where we were like kind of brainstorming ideas, um, I brought up missing and murdered indigenous women because it's something I've been following for a long time. And um, Jesse's like, yeah, I'm totally on board with that. And so we started researching it and very quickly I was like, you're an idiot. <laughs> this is a massive issue. And this, you want to do this first? Like, what are you thinking? Um, we did it. I, I mean, we're still working on it and we're still, you know, we're going to have, it's going to be like a series along lots of episodes. We're going to talk to lots of different people, but yeah, um, we, <laughs> we definitely bit off a little bit more than I think we were ready for initially. But um, I think we did, I mean, we're doing okay with it. We're trying. <laughs> Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. It's uh, I'd I'd rather uh, we take our time with it and get it, get it as right. as right as we can, so to speak, uh, than just try to put content out there for the sake of putting content out there. Um, so just building off of all of what we were talking about um, just now with regard to censorship and uh, uh, internet censorship and how that's increasing, how we're becoming more and more constricted in our uh, agency on the internet. Um, I'm wondering if you can first, for those viewers who don't know or may not know uh, much about Julian Assange and his case, can you just give a little background into who he is, uh, WikiLeaks as well? Uh, and then um, where his, uh, what what his status is now um, with regard to his extradition trial. Uh, and then, um, this is a multi-part question, obviously. Uh, after that, maybe how his uh, persecution has trickled down. Uh, we see it uh, to other whistleblowers and journalists like David McBride, as we just mentioned, and Craig Murray. Yeah. Uh, so, so if you've if you've missed out on the last like ten or twelve years of of being alive, um, <laughs> really hard to find someone who doesn't hasn't heard of Julian Assange or WikiLeaks. But most of the time, they they don't have a complete picture. The picture that they do have is is entirely. Uh, built off of uh, uh, you know the smears of media outlets of multiple countries and their governments. So uh, WikiLeaks was founded in 2006 by Julian Assange as a way to uh, kind of like shorten the gap between whistleblowers coming forward and a media outlet actually getting to be able to print what they what what they were disclosing um when you go to like 
well, for example, look at the uh, the Afghan papers that came out in mm -hmm. 2019 that the Washington Post put out. That's the result of almost three years of FOIA lawsuits. And then they took another, um, you know, six to eight months to compile everything, put it together, and then finally release it. And most, uh, well, most of us, certainly in independent media don't have the cash on hand to bankroll three years of FOIA lawsuits, nor, mm -hmm. nor do we have uh, a, a team that we can just turn to and be like, hey, could you vet this for us while we turn to our legal team saying we're going to get our asses sued off? You know that, right? Can you help us prepare a defense? Um, so that's what WikiLeaks was. It, 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 uh, it allowed for direct communication, not between whistleblower and journalist, but whistle, whistleblower and publishing outlet. And that was really a, a first of its kind. Um, once the, uh, once the, the 2010, uh, Manning leaks came out from, uh, it, you know, I've collateral murder, the Iraq and Afghan war logs, the Gitmo files, and Cablegate. Um, and once those came out, the not just the U.S. public, not just the world public, but world governments really got a good eyeful of what WikiLeaks' core mission was, and that mission is privacy for the weak, transparency for the powerful. And that doesn't mean that you and I are weak. What, what that means is that we do not have political power. We do not have economic power. Our, our, our agency at uh, the voting booth has been largely remo removed from us. So, um, mm -hmm. so WikiLeaks was there to, to do that, to, to provide um, transparency for the powerful. And uh, the, the result of that, was uh, in 2010, they launched a secret grand jury to investigate WikiLeaks. There have been, uh, as a result of Cablegate alone, 100,000 agents in the UK alone were put on investigating WikiLeaks. I have no idea what that number looks like in the US, but I guarantee mm -hmm. you it's higher because we have that much more of a population percentage-wise that works for uh, uh, works for both, you know, the government and their many three-letter agencies. Um, yeah, and we should remind viewers that these uh, hundreds of thousands of agents uh, working uh, to destroy Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, these are unappointed American officials uh, who still make their salaries off of our tax dollars. Uh, yeah. These are people in the um, people in the security and intelligence agencies who uh, they're hired they're not they're not voted into any kind of office so they're basically unaccountable uh, as far as I can think yeah and with at le with their estimates vary but the one that like most people kind of seem to agree on is that 60 percent of all alphabet agencies budgets are black as in not disclosed to me and you or members of congress for that matter um so at when uh when cablegate dropped because i believe it was the latest of the ones that i had mentioned in real no no gitmo it was gitmo gitmo was 2011 um, after the Gitmo files dropped, uh, uh, Julian Assange had found himself being heavily targeted. And, and this, of course, you know, ha had been happening for about a year at that point. But after Cablegate, it went through the roof and Gitmo was kind of the last straw. The Gitmo files were kind of the last straw. Uh, Cablegate was, I believe still is, the largest public disclosure of... Uh, of you know supposedly or supposed to be private communications between the world diplomatic corps and it was just there uh, to this day there's no way you can read them all like there really isn't 
you can go and look up Cablegate and choose a random one every day for basically the rest of your life and find something new in it every single time. Um, the, when, when we talk about treasure troves, man, that's that's it right there. It really is. Um, so Julian became a, a very heavily targeted individual and WikiLeaks as well became a very targeted publishing outlet as a result of this. There were a couple of attempts to infiltrate WikiLeaks and we'll circle back to that when we start talking about the superseding indictment. Um, but, but put a pin in that in your head, WikiLeaks infiltrated. Um, we know through the strap for hacks that private security companies, private intelligence companies were also getting in on what to this day remains a gravy train uh, for both public and private spying apparatuses, uh, which is going after WikiLeaks. We know that from the strap for hacks that they were talking about uh, throwing anything at Assange that they could to keep him tied up in court for the next 25 years. It's a direct quote. Um, do, you know, frustrate their operations, make sure that they couldn't keep producing these materials. And uh, Julian Assange was hit with um, two sexual assault, not charges, because there were never any charges filed. And we can discuss why a little bit too. But uh, two allegations that were uh, would become the, the kind of bulk of the majority of smears against him for the next eight years. Um, he went and voluntarily appeared in front of the Swedish police to discuss this. They were satisfied at the end of that interview and, you know, bade him farewell. He went back to London. They called him back and said, hey, if you could come back, uh, that'd be neat. And at this point, he consulted with his legal team and he said, OK, I'm happy to appear before you again. All you have to do is you have to promise me that as soon as I step foot on U.S. or on Swedish soil, I'm not going to get a black bag put over my head and wind up at, at a torture facility that the United States runs. And they went, so yeah, if you could just get on the plane, you know, that'd be swell. And he's like, I'm going to need the guarantee. And they're like, we can't do that. So uh, he sought asylum. Uh, it had, there were a handful of countries on the list. The country that granted him asylum was Ecuador. Um, in 2012, he went to the, and went into the Ecuadorian embassy uh, where he did not leave for seven and a half years. Uh, and Ecuador granted him this asylum because he was a politically targeted individual. Um, nations aren't in the business of just handing out asylum or citizenship to people because they have a rape allegation, you know, um, which is something that you, one of the more common smears is that, oh, he was hiding out in the embassy or he was holed up in the embassy yeah. duck, ducking rape charges. That's not how that shit works. Not even a little bit. Um, so there are, are uh, emails that have been disclosed between the, um, like Crown Prosecutorial Service. Hey, Steve, just to go back a tiny bit, can you explain yeah. who uh, Strat4 is or was? I don't know if they're still operating. For sure. So Strat4, uh, I, I believe they're still operational. Strat4 is a company started by a guy named Peter Thiel. And uh, what they wanted to be was a um, like half consulting firm, half private intelligence agency and the the waters get really muddied because some of their clients were government some of their clients were private sector um and uh like they they were doing um they were doing consulting work for northrop grumman and, and military contractors and uh and then uh very very high profile uh like fortune 500 companies 
Um, Peter Thiel is a scumbag in his own right in the strap for hack. Even his own employees are talking about what a bastard he is, um, which is, you know, saying a lot for a private spook to be like, yeah, man, this guy's a dick, you know, <laughs> and uh, it, it, it kind of speaks to his character. <clears throat> Uh, so that was strapped for the hack itself uh, became known as the global intelligence files. So if you go to WikiLeaks and you want to know what's in the strap for hack, you look up global intelligence files. Um, but getting back to and it sucks, man, because there's no like TLDR version of what happened to Julian in WikiLeaks. And like to this day, just more shit keeps getting heaped up on top of. Uh, mm -hmm. an, an already egregiously smelly pile. Um, but uh, so we find out um, fairly recently in an interview with Nils Melzer, UN Special Rapporteur on Torture that he gave to Republic Magazine, um, they had uncovered emails between the UK uh, prosecutorial service and the Swedish police. And they're like, don't get cold feet, keep pursuing these charges, don't let up, but don't, uh, or keep pursuing the investigation, keep the investigation open, but don't file charges. And this is the UK to Sweden. The UK to Sweden. Yeah. Keep the investigation open, but don't file charges because if they filed charges, then Julian would have gotten his day in a public Swedish court mm -hmm. where this entire sham would have fallen flat on its face that's the last thing that the u.s or the uk wanted <clears throat> so um from 2012 up until uh 2019 julian assange was in the ecuadorian embassy in 2017 uh with the help of the united states state department and the cia the president that had granted Julian the asylum, Rafael Correa, was uh, defeated mm -hmm. um, by a soulless little puppet called Lenin Moreno. Um, Moreno has done nothing but dance to the tune of the State Department ever since. Uh, the citizenship that had been granted to Julian Assange was stripped from him with zero due process, uh, which is, you know, pretty important to remember if you're going to revoke someone's citizenship, usually there's a process for it. In this case, there was not. Uh, it was removed uh, about a week before the 11th of April in 2019 when, uh, after the ink was dry on a check from the International Monetary Fund for a $4.2 billion loan to Ecuador, Julian was trafficked because he was sold. So he was trafficked out of that embassy. He wasn't, you know, arrested or removed or uh, anything like that. He was, he was trafficked uh, and, and went to um, Belmarsh Prison, which is called the Guantanamo Bay of the United Kingdom, based on the number of terror suspects that are housed there. Um, not a flattering nickname. Also, incidentally, the prison in V for Vendetta, where Evie's parents got dragged off to at the beginning of the, of the uh, flick. Hang on just a second. I have to yell at my children. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> kids so much <laughs> i'm so glad i have somebody here watching my kids right now <laughs> so anywho um uh during the the entire time that lena moreno uh was the newly elected president of venezuela or venezuela she's fuck ecuador um <laughs> until he was until julian was trafficked out uh moreno a uh, guy named David Morales, Sheldon Adelson, the uh, U.S. ambassador to Germany, and Donald Trump kind of all got together in this special deep state hug. And, and they said, uh, how are we going to get rid of this guy? How are we going to get this guy? Uh, and so David Morales runs a security firm, although for not much longer because he's going to prison, and here's why. Uh, called UC Global, 
and UC Global was providing the security at the Ecuadorian embassy um, at the behest of the CIA. And we know this from excellent reporting in both El Pais and the Gray Zone. Um, at the behest of the CIA, UC Global was uh, bugging the shit out of that embassy. Not just the suite of rooms where Julian was uh, basically imprisoned. And that's not me talking. That's the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention who found that, uh, that Julian was being arbitrarily detained. And uh, then Nils Melzer, Special Rapporteur on Torture, who with the, the assistance of two doctors um, have... have uh, come forward saying that uh, during that period of time, Julian Assange was psychologically tortured because he couldn't leave. He couldn't mm -hmm. leave. Guy had a, a chronic lung condition and couldn't go to the hospital. Couldn't leave. That's the, that's the, the you know, seriousness of, of, of this arbitrary detention. Um, and we should point out that uh, Nils Melzer initially was not uh, convinced, if you will, that Julian was being tortured, but not on board. Didn't want to look into it, right? But I he talk about this all the time because he he's one of the people that gives me hope because he was completely kind of um, he kind of bought into the propaganda. He didn't. He was very hesitant to even look into it. He didn't like didn't want to touch it. Um, but then when he did and he um, examined the actual evidence. He did something that's kind of incredible. He changed his mind. <laughs> when presented with new evidence, he changed his mind. And so I, I talk about that all the time. That gives me hope. And that's why I keep, I, I talk to like random people all the time because even if somebody's misinformed, it, once you present them with the information, there is a chance that they could change their mind. Yeah, and, and he did. And this is why we know so much uh, about um, the, the fake rape allegations, uh, this is why we know so much about Julian Assange's torture over the years is because he's given interviews, he's written extensively about it. Um, but UC Global would not, they, uh, they were spying on Julian Assange to the point to where there were, uh, there was surveillance equipment in the women's bathroom at the Ecuadorian embassy. And the information that they were gathering um, was both given uh, to the CIA in hard copy and in real time. There were separate servers that were running, that were hosting the feed from the Ecuadorian embassy that transmitted directly to Langley. So this is a, on its, on its face, it's reason enough to throw the case against Julian Assange out the window because the man has not had a private conversation with his legal team since 2017. Um, on, on its face, it's enough to throw the case against Julian Assange out the window because of the numerous other gross violations of his human rights and his international civil, civil liberties. But we are dealing with uh, the Five Eyes countries, uh, Australia, the UK, um, Canada, New Zealand, and the US. And what that, the Five Eyes are a, a it's a global um, intelligence sharing agreement um, that, that's been set up for a number of years. And uh, what it basically, what it basically amounts to is that we don't have governments that run intelligence agencies. We have intelligence agencies that run governments. And the case against Julian Assange is a real time example of that happening. And yeah. just for viewers, if anybody wants more information on the Five Eyes country, Susie Dawson does an amazing job of that. And we'll link that in the um, show notes if anybody wants to check out her series on that is like a must it's a must consume piece of information so um just wanted to point that out in case anybody wants more information yeah no she she did a master class it was it was brilliant and it's one of those things where like 
you, so much information is packed into it that you even if you like sit there and take notes you, you still have to uh, every you know three six months go back and rewatch it because you forgot stuff that and freeing julian assange part three yes uh, like everything that Susie has written has been pretty fucking good but the freeing julian assange series and the third part specifically is like a uh an activist fucking survival guide <laughs> it's, uh, it's brilliant it, it is uh but um the kind of like i, I know this is taking up a, a whole lot of time because it, it just it's a complicated issue so it's fine well there's no short way to tell this story um but uh after you know seven and a half years of illegal and arbitrary detention um Julian was trafficked out of the embassy, put into Belmarsh prison, ostensibly for a bail jumping charge. He was given a 50 week sentence for that, which was the longest sentence that the modern UK court had handed out for jumping bail. Uh, when he had served all of it, they went, hope you're comfy because you're not going anywhere. And he has been a prisoner held on remand ever since September of last year, um, which it, he was a political prisoner anyway, but holding him in the Guantanamo Bay of the United Kingdom with no charges whatsoever, simply awaiting an extradition hearing it is like even people who don't personally like the guy because they heard the television say something bad about him even those people need to be able to recognize that this is a political prisoner you know well, it's, it's kind of crazy too when he asked for compassionate release um and we've talked about this before on the action for Assange strings but um it, they you know they they literally said well we can't release him because he hasn't been charged with anything, which is yeah. a completely ridiculous statement if you just think about what that means. He hasn't been charged, so he should be able to be let go. It's just so bizarre, the things that they're able to get away with with him. Um, and I know that, it, it, like we've been talking about, it's really because of the smear campaign. They've been manufacturing the consent um, of the torture and mistreatment of this one individual for over a decade. And so people have this, you know, image in their head of this monster that Julian Assange is, that he's, you know, a rapist and he's responsible for the deaths of all these people and he's a hacker and he's a traitor and he's a this. And um, so people, like, they just don't care. They've become the, numb to it. The traitor one is especially funny. <laughs> it really is. Traitor to who? Australia? Right. <laughs> That's another thing, too. Um, and I... I, I it just completely frustrates me that he's an Australian journalist um, who had dual Ecuadorian citizenship, who was on Ecuadorian property in the UK. Um, his WikiLeaks is not a US publication. They have no ties to the United States. And yet the United States somehow has the power to um, ask for his extradition and to charge him under our Espionage Act. And, you know, they say that, you know, the First Amendment doesn't apply to him, but our rules do. Like, it, it's, it's the craziest thing. Um, and, and that people, um, and I know that it's just that a lot of people just don't understand what's going on or the implications of it, but it's terrifying. That means that the United States can go after anybody, anywhere, anytime, if you say anything that embarrasses them or pisses them off. Well, and that's and it sets the precedent that yeah. any other country can do that too. Absolutely. If you are a Greek reporter writing about higher Bolsonaro, you could be next. Yep. It, you know, it, it, it is, it's the death of investigative journalism. And, and it's already had such a chilling effect. You can tell. I mean, we talked about independent media earlier. Um, there, there are issues that people won't touch because they're afraid to, uh, they see, I mean, and I tell people this all the time, what's happening to Julian Assange really has very little to do with Julian Assange. And it's more about sending a message. Um, he's being used as the proverbial head on a stake. This is, this is your warning. You piss us off. This is what's going to happen to you. 
Um, they could, I mean, let's be real. They could have dealt with him, you know, dealt with him a long time ago. Um, well, and they they didn't want for to. It. They, yeah. They, I mean, they want to use him as an example. That's what yeah. he's being used as an example. This is your warning. This is what happens to you. Chelsea Manning's been used as an example. If you blow the whistle, this is what happens to you. And now Julian's being used as the example that if you're a journalist or you're a publisher and you have the nerve to expose our dirty secrets, we're going to come for you. And we're going to destroy your entire life, the lives of your families, and it's going to you know, it's going to suck and you don't want to do that. And that's, I mean, we see the effects of it all over independent media. Um, and it's really frustrating to see because um, that this is a time where we need to like speak out and, you know, we got to stand together and get the information out there. So it's, yeah, it, but you did mention the superseding indictment. That's something I really want to get to because that's super important. Can you kind of explain what the superseding indictment is, what's in it and why it's bullshit? Yeah, so in uh, in 2019, the original 18-count indictment against Julian Assange came out from the Justice Department. Like you were just saying, uh, most of those charges have to do with the Espionage Act of 1917. Um, 17 of those charges are all Espionage Act violations. Uh, the 18th charge is conspiracy to commit computer intrusion, which is a hacking charge. Um, when you actually read the the charges, um, they're farcical on the whole because they're accusing him of aiding Chelsea Manning with covering her identity in the the system where she was pulling all of the the data that became the Iraq and Afghan war logs and the Gitmo files, Cablegate, <clears throat> as well as the collateral murder video. And another video that was stolen from WikiLeaks that never aired. Uh, but it was another video of a, a helicopter attack and ensuing war crimes. Um, so this charge, they're, they're saying, you know, he conspired to help her hide her identity. Turns out in Chelsea's court martial testimony that it, uh, she did not even need a username, let alone a password to access this material. So what did she have to cover? What tracks did she have to cover? None, it, not even a little bit. But what they're doing is criminalizing the way that investigative journalism works. So if, uh, and Glenn Greenwald has said this a number of times. In fact, Glenn Greenwald very nearly got charged for the exact same thing in the Bolsonaro government. And mm -hmm. thankfully, Brazil's Supreme Court stepped in and said, no, you don't get to do that. You don't get to charge someone for doing journalism. In fact, you need to stop persecuting Glenn Greenwald. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have Brazil's Supreme Court. You know, we we don't. We we've got uh, a bunch of reactionary dinosaurs and uh, and a handful of other justices that are there to protect the status quo um, and corporate America's bottom line. Mm -hmm. and, and that's that's who we have for our nine justices. Um, but uh, so. The the hacking charge the cyber terrorism charge uh it's it's important to note that uh in in the span of the same week back in 2012 joe biden and mitch mcconnell both referred to julian assange as a high-tech terrorist mm -hmm. both of them and these are people that are supposed to be diametrically opposed to each other the one of them currently you know um, is uh, having his partially animated corpse rolled out in front of a camera on occasion uh, in order to say some nonsense and then be wheeled back off before he, you know, sharts himself on camera again. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but that's, the, you know, the, the, the sentiment within Washington, D.C. has never once changed about Julian Assange, the exception being Tulsi Gabbard. And uh, I'm not even sure what that was all about in lieu of the trajectory yeah. that she's taken. Uh, uh, given given her 
her track record now after dropping out and endorsing Biden, who knows what, you know, which parts of what she said uh, were true or I'm are true. I'm calling in a couple of favors when we go to D.C. and I'm going to see if the Jackman brothers can't get a, a uh, contingent from Action for Assange to meet with Tulsi Gabbard while we're there. We're going to be there for three I weeks. I tweeted at her. Tried, I tried. I, I, yeah. I took my shot. I tweeted at her and told her I'd love to see her on the live stream because she is the only... I mean, I have my issues with Tulsi. I mean, I've been very clear about that, but she was and is the only elected official that I can think of. Maybe I'm wrong. There might be a couple more, but that, that has even had the courage to say his name, yeah. let alone stand in strong defense and straight up say that she would drop everything against yeah. him, against Snowden. Right. I mean, that's, I, okay. I will always respect her for that and appreciate her for that. My uncertainty lies with um, basically what she did with her campaign and then endorsing Biden. Does she, did she mean any of what she said? Um, I have no inclination to trust her. Uh, it would be interesting for sure to talk to her and put those questions to her. But um, I think she's just another in a long litany of, uh, I don't know, wannabe figureheads. I don't know what you call them anymore, but um, it, I have no no trust in what she says um, or what she uh, promises to do, uh, whatever she's doing now. Um, but I would talk to her. I would put these questions to her, but I don't, I don't, I don't have any hope in her. I wouldn't even cuss her out at the beginning. What's that? I said I wouldn't even cuss her out, like, to start with. <laughs> Right. <laughs> you know, um, but back to the superseding indictment real quick, because this is uh, because there are 17 espionage act charges, because this represents this case against Julian Assange represents the death of investigative journalism, the precedent that any country can go after any journalist or publisher from anywhere for any reason that they put in that national security basket. Um, because of all of that, it is impossible to not see a political connection to this. The, you know, he's, he's a political prisoner. He's being persecuted for political reasons. And there's a, a, the extradition treaty that the U.S. has with the U.K. says that you cannot be extradited from one country or the other if it's for a political reason. The fucking Queen of England said it. Uh, for that matter. Uh, but um, so in order to get around that, they have filed the superseding indictment. Um, and we'll we'll find out Monday on what merit it has in, in the courtroom there. But originally, um, Julian's defense team and the the concierge of the U.S. State Department, Magistrate Vanessa Baratzer, did not receive a copy of it. The superseding indictment was released directly to the U.S. media, not to a legal team, not to the judge in the case. Still haven't got a good, still haven't got a good legal answer as to why that happened. I've gotten a number of of good answers as to why it happened, though. Um, so this is, is to go this is DOJ's superseding indictment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Just want to clarify that. Yeah, so so what it does, the Department of Justice uh, filed the superseding indictment that doesn't add any new charges. The date to add new charges has well been passed. But what it does, it is it, it expands on the the cyber crime charge. Um, and to do it, they rely on the all star testimony of two individuals. One is named Hector Monsigur, whose online name was Sabu, who was the paid FBI rat who set up the group of hackers in 2012 called Lulsec, uh, and that's where the Stratfor hack came from. 
That mm -hmm. was when 70 million Sony users got hacked. That was LulzSec. Um, they're mentioned heavily in this indictment. Sabu's testimony, the rat, um, he's, his testimony forms a, a pretty good bulk of the detail into LulzSec. Um, the other star witness for the U.S. Department of Justice is another paid FBI informant who was originally paid and instructed to infiltrate WikiLeaks uh, back in 2011. And it's a guy named uh, Seeger Thordeson, who is a convicted pedophile and a convicted embezzler and a convicted con man and a certified by Icelandic mental health professionals sociopath. So the, the testimony of the U.S. government, and I think they did it because they knew nobody in the fucking media was going to report critically on it that, mm -hmm. um, that would have a blue check next to their name. You right. know, I think they did it because they could just pump out these salacious details like Julian Assange was giving the orders to anonymous and like shit like that. That's actual text in the indictment um, <laughs> without anybody questioning it. And, and so the way that action for Assange responded to this was, OK, it's expanding on the cyber crime charge. Who do we know? that is really fucking good with uh, breaking down anything cyber related. Sean O'Brien runs Privacy Safe, lecturer at Yale, ran the Yale Privacy Lab. He'd be a good guy to get on for this. Oh, they're going after Anonymous. Who do we know in Anonymous? We know your Mark Lubers. And we know Commander X. Um, Commander X had just been on my show. So we got uh, Mark Lubers to come on. And we broke down all of the, the, the entire indictment that had to do, the part of it that had to do with Lulzsec and um, Sabu and Siggy, the pedophile embezzler con man, uh, both paid FBI informants. Um, so there's another part of the, go ahead, sorry. Let me just clarify something if I can. So you're saying LulzSec was behind the Stratfor hacks, correct? Um, and technically the FBI was behind the Stratfor hack. Okay, so. But yes, that, yes, LulzSec claimed responsibility for those hacks, yeah. Okay, and that information is available on WikiLeaks? Yeah, it's the, the strap for hack is the global intelligence files. Okay. Um, there's a great documentary that your viewers might want to check out. Not great, but not terrible. It's good. Um, it's called uh, The Hacker Wars. And yeah. in this documentary, it breaks down a lot of this because it was just shortly after, um, shortly after the, the hacks came out or it came out that Sabu was a rat. And, and so um, I think people who are uh, affiliated with Anonymous, part of that collective, were the people who put together the documentary and released it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's a, um, a part in it where it shows that within 48 hours of the Strat4 hack taking place, all of the files from the Strat4 hack had landed on FBI servers. Hmm. Um, it's important to remember that Sabu had already been flipped before a single hack that was claimed by LulzSec had taken place. So in essence, the FBI rounded up a group of hackers and said, go create mayhem. And by the way, you know, try really hard to make this, uh, uh, you know, front page news on WikiLeaks. And uh, for that, Sabu was financially compensated and rewarded. Uh, with his freedom <laughs> because Jeremy Hammond's still in jail to this day and Sabu served nary an hour behind bars over this. Um, and then, uh, uh, yeah, and uh, Siggy, that guy, 
Um, you know, he's free to get in trouble in Iceland, um, you know, all he wants, but he had now did not face a single charge in the U.S. over his role in hacking Stratfor. And then you have uh, Barrett Brown, who's feted in some circles as uh, a sort of uh, revolutionary hacker hero of some sort who resides in Dallas, Texas now, I think, and wears cowboy boots. And um, I stopped following him on Twitter because it was so obnoxious. But uh, he was on Chris Hedges' uh, show on Contact uh, several years ago. I oh. also wear cowboy boots. I have nothing against cowboy boots. <laughs> it's, it, it's just the way Barrett Brown wears them. That's hilarious. <laughs> and you know, so without trying to go to war with Barrett Brown, I will say that at least he makes it obvious that he's compromised. Uh, uh, well, the way that he treats the the people that he's supposedly helping, the way that he conducts his affairs in general, and the way that when he's questioned about, like, hey, are you working for the feds? It, it, it leaves you... It left me no doubts that he was compromised. He did four years mm -hmm. on a fucking 45 to life sentence. Yeah, that is, it, it does appear pretty obvious, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I, I, I don't have any um, gripe with Barrett Brown in particular, other than that his deep association with Lulsec and the Stratfor leaks and uh, <clears throat> the connection you uh, elucidated earlier to to the FBI. Um, it, my problem is that he's, again, like I said, still feted uh, in some leftist circles as mm -hmm. uh, uh, a hero of sorts. And something Look, else. Yeah, that dude has some fucking style. Like, he does. Like, that motherfucker was doing fucking, like, live chats from his bathtub with a like, glass of wine <laughs> and shit. And, but, you know, I mean, he was uh, the penultimate smug little cracker from Dallas, you know? And, like, loved just waving it in the faces of mainstream outlets that he was better connected than they were, that he had access or he could have access to all their deepest, darkest secrets. And he was just a fucking little punk ass about it. Like, uh, so it got him a lot of favor in those circles, you know, not, and by the way, Barry Brown was never a hacker and I don't think he's ever claimed to be a hacker. He just got in, uh, on the ground floor with some of the people in Anonymous um, because he wasn't writing hit pieces about them. He was like, oh, this is fucking cool, and I want to explore this a little bit more, you know? Yeah. Um, so that's yeah. where, you know, he would, like, I joke about being the public relations liaison for Anonymous. That's a joke, by the way, mm -hmm. but... But that's that's kind of like also a little sideways fuck you to Barrett Brown because that's what he made himself. Yeah, yeah. And I've had a uh, brief, a few brief Twitter exchanges with him and he always came off as this smug dork and dick. And uh, <laughs> I I just couldn't make heads or tails of him. And this this narrative that we've just been going through, it, it makes uh, his disposition uh, make a lot more sense. And uh, yeah, I think he's sort of a red herring in, in for leftists. Uh, so. I, I would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, I would say I definitely concur with that. Yeah, well. it's nothing personal. I don't ever think about- I don't know Barrett Brown. I'll probably yeah. never meet Barrett Brown. Right. You know, like I no, it's it's not there's nothing personal behind it. It's you know, I, it, these are and observations from yeah. from a place of I guess 
from more information than what most people have about Barrett Brown, you know, but that's not like I'm special because I have this information. Anybody can go and find the information too. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not interested in, uh, I guess, canceling him. I should say oh. days it's, I just think it's fair to ask the question, who is this guy? What was he involved with? What did he do? Why is he, why does he have this level of esteem in, in certain circles? Um, and it connects to to what we're talking about with with Julian and WikiLeaks. So um, that's it. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, Eric. Yeah. You watch no, you watch I, this I, and defends you, uh, but I'm not sorry. I, I <laughs> sorry, think he's compromised as fuck. I I don't I don't see him actively recruiting to take other you know to like make sure that people go down as a result of what he's doing. I'll, I'll say that. Mm-hmm. But if I do. If I ever do hear that he's actively trying to recruit hackers to go do some fucking dirty business, I'm going to get really loud about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay. So now that we've covered kind of the superseding indictment, um, the the extradition hearing starts back up again in September, the 7th, right? I always forget if it's the 7th or the 8th. 7th? 7th. Um, So, okay. So Action for Assange was there in February, which was sweet. Um, you guys did a lot of on the ground activism. You went to the prison where Chelsea and Jeremy Hanning, Hammond were both being held. Um, you, you know, try to get some media interested, which, you know, we all know how well that went. Um, but yeah, so you guys are going back in September. What kind, I, I know you guys plan, if you can, to be there for the entire three weeks. What kind of actions do you guys have planned? I know you don't want to talk about too much. Um, but you know, can you kind of give us an idea of the things that you hope to accomplish while you're down there? Yeah, um, we will be we will be back in front of the White House a few times. Uh, we did a we did a march in February from the White House to Trump Tower and then the Department of Justice building, um, which was very long because I've got a broken leg that I've been walking around on for 14 years and I fucking, I, I don't like long walks on concrete. I, I just don't. I never have. Even when I had perfectly good sticks. Prefer not to be on concrete. Um, but when we were at the DOJ, uh, Andrew, my, my co-host, uh, our co-host, Misty, uh, <laughs> Uh, he read out loud right in front of the DOJ the speech that Eugene Debs had given that got him 10 years. Um, and like flat out told them, like screamed into a megaphone. Uh, Eugene Debs had to do prison time over this. By all rights, you should be arresting me right now. And we're like, okay, buddy, you could, you know, maybe don't tell Department of <laughs> Homeland Security and people out in front of the doj that they need to be arresting you right now like i don't have bail money for you bro i don't you know i don't know if we can crowd that crowdfund that up for my huh we can crowdfund that for sure yeah i I didn't think we could do it before my flight left though you know oh yeah yeah. (laughs) Uh, fair enough but uh we're going to do more media days we were uh, we were in front of the Washington Post and ABC and the building that houses Politico and the Hill. Um, we actually like ran into Crystal Ball. Uh, she came out uh, came out of the building. Um, I've never seen Andrew run faster in my entire life. Like he like he ran because he, he was gonna just kind of like you know huffle on over there and be like hey by the way we're here and we're doing this and blah 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 but he was he was so excited that he overshot her and had to like turn around and then like kind of calmly walk back towards her and her fucking you know forty five hundred dollar Burberry jacket and um and he told you know he was like hey this is what we're doing we're in town we're doing it we're here for and at that point we were there for three more days um since you have this show, could you stop by and cover an event? You know, you're welcome to participate in it. She blew a lot of smoke up our ass and then vanished. 
Um, so uh, one of the one of the things that made DC distinctive in February was we got lied to by Crystal Ball. Um, yeah. Well, a lot of a lot of those uh, so-called progressive or self-styled leftist or liberal media figures like Crystal Ball, uh, I don't think they actually believe in in what they propound. I think that they put on the patina of doing that. Uh, but just look at their show, look at the production quality, look how she dresses, look how she acts with regard to one of the most the important human rights cases in the world right now. Part of Julian Assange's situation. They spent like an entire 10 minutes on their show mocking him and laughing at him. So <laughs> I got no love for Crystal Ball. No. Sorry, when I don't had, progressive When they had Greenwald on to talk about it, um, they started off with inaccurate information like it wasn't mm -hmm. a full-blown smear but it was rubbing up against it and the very first thing that greenwald says in that interview is like oh i've got, I've got to correct you on this one you know like that's how they started it mm -hmm. i haven't been able to find that clip since the day that it was circulating on twitter when the interview happened um but uh but yeah i mean that's the the their show the hill is a conservative outlet a very conservative outlet always has been and what their show does is or what it would like to do regardless of whether it works out or not is they want to make sure that conservatives get elected if that means we we are going to spend the bulk of our time exposing the hypocrisy the, the Democrats embody every single time they draw breath. Cool. You know, but that's the platform. The platform mm -hmm. is, you know, we're going to let Crystal fake pretend that she's a real progressive, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. And that uh, Cigar is, um, you know, her, her, kind of like right wing counterpoint yeah her foil it, yeah although i from what i can tell they agree with each other fairly often yeah well i guess when you have a show with um a sign on the set that looks like it should be in the lobby of a law firm you you've got to agree with each other once in a while it's fucking funny partners, partners in the same firm yeah, they they are. And look, I mean, why why people in independent media are fucking like sh just tripping over each other to fucking lick those two's assholes is just beyond me. Mm -hmm. It's never been anything other than confirmation of biases at best. At worst, it's fucking putting a bunch of notions into people's heads that are always going to confirm the right-wing point of view. Well, listen, they had Andy no, 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 whatever on their show, like, to whine about how he was, everybody was mean to him. And Segar is like, oh, he's a good friend of mine. And fuck off, dude. I mean, really, that's the kind of people you're going to elevate on your show? And then proclaimed to be some like progressive voice of reason fuck off like i got no time for it it's well, and I mean, they had greenwald on but greenwald had just had those two on his show and yeah so i don't know if they would have had glenn on if it wouldn't have been like basic tit for tat yeah like same day shit i don't know yeah I, I know that they're not having anyone else come on to talk to them about Julian Assange who knows fucking a goddamn thing about it. And I'm pretty sure that there's a lot of that content that Greenwald had that did not make the final cut for the episode. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I haven't seen that episode. Um, I don't watch it. I don't, I don't watch them either, man. Somebody tagged me in it, uh, and I was like, ah, you know, because I've I've gone after Crystal Ball and and The Hill and Rising publicly. Um, so whenever something like 
halfway positive towards Julian Assange comes out of that show, which has been once with Glenn Greenwald recently, you know, then uh, like 30 people in Rose Twitter are fucking lighting up my mentions like, what the hell, Glenn Greenwald, you got to take back everything you said about her. Do it now, you know. That's our shiny fucking golden goddess. You can't, you can't say bad things. You, you're, you're mean, you know. And so I, I watched the clip, but then when I went to go try and find the entire interview, I couldn't find it. And yeah. that's really typical for for the Hill because it was almost impossible to fucking dig out the clip from where they were just giggling over the torture of Julian Assange. Yeah. Oh, that still makes my blood boil. Still makes my blood boil. Oh, I got that was so such much trouble for fucking bringing that to light. Yeah, I'm sure you did. I'm. I feel your pain. <laughs> I feel your pain entirely. <laughs> okay, so um, I know you guys are. You have a GoFundMe for your trip to DC. I mean, listen, guys. DC is expensive. They have to travel. They have lodging. I mean, they got to feed each other. They got to, you know buy supplies and everything. So um, we'll link the GoFundMe in the show notes, um, obviously. Oh. Um, and I tweet it out all the time. And um, I was your you first do. donor. You were. proud of myself for that. I was, awesome. very first one. Um, so be cool like me and donate. If you can't donate, share it, because that helps too. The more eyes on it, then the more people who can donate will. Um, but um, is there, like, I know you guys are also working on the teach-ins. The second one was just released last night, which is, awesome i watched it this morning it's so good um what how many are you guys just going to keep doing those um we're going to do as like, many as we can until we go to dc and uh depending on what happens uh if we have to make more we'll we'll make more uh but the whole point of the the teaching I, yeah. pardon yeah <laughs> No, that's what I was going to say. Do you want to kind of explain okay. what the teach-ins are? Yeah, the, the, the way. <laughs> point is um, we've done them like mini documentary style. Uh, and the, the goal is to inform people who may have only had like a little bit of information or incomplete information or flat out wrong information uh, about Julian Assange and about WikiLeaks and about Chelsea Manning and all of the issues that that have kind of surrounded just the name of WikiLeaks over the last several years. Uh, so put it together in a way that's like easily digestible for people who aren't familiar with the material. And then to also remind people who have been long term supporters of exactly what is at stake. Um, and I think at least with the first two that we've done a decent job of getting both of those uh, across. Um, the third one that we're going to do is to deconstruct the uh, all of the Russiagate smears around WikiLeaks and Julian Assange. Um, and for that, we are relying heavily on veterans intelli veteran intelligence professionals for sanity. Uh, that's the organization that Ray McGovern uh, founded back in the lead up to the Iraq war. I mean, it might have had it in 2002, but I'm not 100 percent on that. But uh, VIPs members have included NSA whistleblower Bill Benny, uh, uh, CIA whistleblower John Kiriakou. Um, there are uh, just some tremendous individuals that have been involved in that. Scott Ritter. Uh, just, a uh, 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 some, yeah, I, absolute experts in, in their particular areas. Um, so, uh, so that, yeah, that's the Russiagate one. We're going to start workshopping, um, probably this weekend and we should, have it written in about a week, I think. Uh, well, if you want to ask somebody who has connections to Putin, I am his buddy. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I am. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, Maduro. I am Maduro. Maduro. Uh, <laughs> the the challenge with the Russiagate one is to pull back 
because it's so easy to get kind of lost in the the minutia of everything when it comes down to it and what we're really talking about is um rushgate was a response to hillary clinton not becoming president we know from wikileaks that uh Clinton's relationship with Russia was, according to their own internal polling, her biggest weakness. So what does a good little acolyte of, you know, Goebbels or Karl Rove do? You flip that around on your opponent and you make it your, make it your strength. And when the DNC got, uh, when the DNC got their their data breach and got uh however many separate files. bill benny can just rattle off the number of emails that are in the the dnc leaks um you know the uh when that happened um all hell broke loose like absolute all hell broke loose and whatever uh whatever favor julian Assange had curried from like rank and file Democrats was immediately just chucked under the bus because he told on mother. Yeah. You know? Here. And it wasn't just rank and file Democrats, the organization that he helped found during the uh the the banking blockade of WikiLeaks where major credit card companies stopped processing payments to WikiLeaks at the behest of the U.S. government. Um, when that happened, the Freedom of the Press Foundation was formed, and uh, the Julian kept himself off of the governing body of it, um, which in hindsight may have been not the best idea. Uh, but yeah, they threw his ass under the bus in 2016 after that they really did just oh it was brutal uh, and we should note that uh Ed edward snowden is currently president of that foundation correct yep to this day was named chairman of it and i believe 2015 or 2016 before the the leaks came out um and remains so but uh I don't know what's going on in that guy's head, man. I there's, you know, it he said the right things most of the time when it comes to Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. But there's this organization that he ostensibly has a lot of pull with that has made it a policy to smear the guy. Mm -hmm. yeah i don't i haven't read any uh explanation on snowden's part as to why uh his organization or not his organization but the organization he's uh heavily affiliated with uh did what it did um but just to wrap up here um sort of going off the uh the theme of uh, institutions, media institutions, and uh, freedom of the press institutions uh, essentially abandoning uh, Julian in his his hour of need. Um, some people might look at it and say, "Well, it's just it's just one man, it's just one organization." But the truth is that it's already started to trickle down. It has been trickling down to other whistleblowers and uh, journalists uh, for a long time now, uh, and it's getting worse. And I'm thinking of the recent cases uh, with David McBride from Australia and uh, Craig Murray, the journalist from the UK. Uh, and I'm, wonder, I'm wondering, uh, you know, to wrap this all up as to why this, why Julian's uh, play is so important. Um, if you could, if you could speak about what's happening with those two individuals and just how in general that can become a plague to journalism, uh, actual journalism overall. Yeah. Um, Dave McBride was a, an Australian army lawyer 
And um, he, while he was active duty, he had discovered that the Australian army was complicit in war crimes and uh, had serious waste and fraud and just general uh, abuses of their mandate, abuses of their mandate, not just in their own charter, but to the Australian people. So he wrestled with this for a number of years. When he finally came forward with it, um, it was after exhausting himself, trying to go through the chain of command and trying to take all of the avenues that are provided for people with, you know, uh, complaints of this nature. Uh, and he was rebuffed and outright dismissed at every turn with his higher ups in the army. So he finally had that like crisis of backbone that whistleblowers have mm -hmm. the crisis of conscience has already taken place, you know? So all right. you have to determine is whether or not you're going to go forward. Mm -hmm. And that takes the crisis of backbone. Uh, and he found his, and he went to the Australian broadcasting company, which is also called ABC. Right. Uh, and he gave over all of the documentation that he had to a journalist there. The ABC reported on it. Their offices were subsequently raided with everybody's computer getting taken, not just the journalists who wrote the articles, but everybody's computer got hemmed up in that. Um, that particular journalist may be facing charges. David McBride himself is facing 50 years for pointing out the war crimes, not for committing them, for pointing them out. Right. He's facing 50 years. Uh, and we should also and, mention that he initially tried to go through proper channels. Yeah. So that's, I mean, Chelsea tried to go through proper channels. David McBride tried to go through proper channels. Thomas Drake tried to go through proper, proper channels. When those, when those options. So did Bill Benny. Yeah. When those, when that doesn't work out, what do we expect whistleblowers to do when they try to go through proper channels and do the right thing and nothing happens? What do we expect them to do? I mean, it, it's it it's kind of nuts that we get mad at them for going to the media when their concerns aren't being dealt with. Yeah, and if you boil it down to the basic logic of making it a crime to report on war crimes and crimes against humanity, uh, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, it's it's basically uh, a huge stone wall that's put up for for good journalism of any kind, for transparency of any kind. Uh, it's it's an oxymoron, essentially, what they're trying to do to criminalize whistleblowing on state criminality. No, it, and, and that's, I mean, that's what it, that's what it boils down to. That's the whole point is to de-incentivize wherever possible, criminalize when that doesn't work coming forward with, with information as a whistleblower. Um, in Craig Murray's case, simply writing about what was transpiring in courtrooms is what has got him hand up. And they, they've actually like, they've, uh, they've tried to paint Craig Murray as this like supreme influential being who somehow has control over the minds of everyone who may wander anywhere near his website. Right. And, uh, and specifically cite his reporting on Julian Assange's hearing back in February in their own indictment against him. And Craig Murray is not scared. Like, not at least publicly. He might be, you know, he might be concerned about his future but he is not going to roll over for the scottish government on this right not at all and it would be really silly to think that the scottish government isn't being leaned on by the uk or the us uh, uh, almost certainly i would say craig murray may lose his freedom and may lose his rights for writing about what happened in a courtroom like that's just fucking ridiculous in which he was present yeah 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 so that's i think 
to wrap it, that's that's a good point to end on. That's how. Let, let me say this real quick because this is the the crux of it. There's a a, a new resurgence in taking to the streets to demand your agency that's been going on since memorial day for over the the uh you know almost nine minute execution uh of george floyd mm -hmm. and um Got, i have my uh george floyd memorial shirt on right here all right i don't know if you can see it but i can yeah can <laughs> um, custom actually so wild dude so fucking wild um, and not because a, a, an unarmed black man got murdered by a cop. Just the the how we got there and why we haven't changed anything yet. That's fucking wild to me. Mm -hmm. um, but because that has happened, it is incumbent on me to mention this. Whatever it is you advocate for, whatever it is you want to see done through your personal activism or the activism that you support online or how it, you know activism doesn't work without your ability to get this information out into the public if we lose investigative journalism if the censorship that is going on in social media right now increases and i don't see how it can't uh at least in the short term um, if all that goes away, your activism doesn't stand a chance in hell. And that doesn't mean drop your activism and run over to the action for Assange discord. Find us on discord. Um, it doesn't mean that at all. What it means <laughs> is while you are advocating for whatever it is you're advocating, you should be relaying to everyone in your organization we don't get to do this much longer if we don't come together and stand up for julian assange absolutely and uh yeah i think that's the point i wanted to uh to try to get you to speak to um with regard to what's happening to david mcbride and and craig murray especially uh with regard to journalism um steve thank you so much for joining us uh thank you. I'm, glad, I'm glad we could uh get a uh an uncut uh recording this time <laughs> <laughs> yes that was great do you want to uh steve can you tell everybody where they can find you on social media all your platforms and stuff that i mean yeah. we'll link everything in the show notes but if you want to just you know, give a quick run through for sure uh so the the free assange vigil uh streams tuesday at 9 p.m eastern and saturday at 1 p.m eastern uh, on the action, the number four Assange YouTube channel, uh, on my channel, Slow News Day, and on Unity for Jay, uh, who have been lending us their platform for a number of months, and they're just fucking beautiful people for that. Uh, my show is called Slow News Day. If you're looking for it on YouTube, you type in Slow News Day podcast into the search bar. I'm also on The Rockfin and D Live. Uh, I am at Slow News Day Show on Twitter. Um, the A for A Twitter is action underscore the number four Assange. Um, and by the way, and we're on Rockfin and, and D Live as well. I think Twitch too, but I'm not 100% on that anymore. Yeah, we, we used are. to be on Periscope and they done fucked us. <laughs> uh, they really did, dude. Periscope wouldn't just stop playing my videos. Um, uh, like right before the McAfee interview too, it sucked. Um, but, uh, oh, and by the way, if you are just kind of skimming around the slow news day channel, watch the interview with John McAfee. It's hilarious. Okay. <laughs> and we, yeah. we should, we should, uh, let viewers know that we're going to be on a uh, slow news day on a uh, Sunday. Uh, I don't know if we're going live or just recording. Oh, we're going live. All right. Oh, yeah. live. Doing it live. Do it live. <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah misty and i are both uh very much looking forward to that thank you for inviting us on should be a good oh, yeah. conversation yeah so that'll be sunday at uh at 1 p.m eastern 10 a.m pacific and um and yeah and uh see deepa driver will be on the free assange vigil this saturday 
David Rovix will be on on Tuesday. Really looking forward to both of those. And then the following Saturday on the uh, Assange Vigil, Stefania Maruzzi will be our guest. And I'm really looking forward to speaking with her. She is an incredible journalist. And her work through freedom of information requests and exposing just how nightmarish the process of getting a freedom of information request fulfilled is in, just invaluable. And I know this is an overused cliche, but she's a bulldog. Like she does not give up. She just keeps at it, keeps fighting. And um, yeah, she's been incredible. I mean, she does amazing work. Yep. Okay, well, Steve, thank you very much for uh, joining us. I really, really appreciate it. I'm really looking forward to be on Slow News Day on Sunday. And uh, you can find me on Twitter at Sarcasm Stardust. Jesse, do you want to tell them where they can find you at? Uh, I'm at Jesse Zerwell. That's J-E-S-S-E-Z-U-R-A-W-E-L-L. -E -E uh, that's, uh, that's me on Twitter. And uh, you can find us um, on our YouTube channel. Uh, there's uh, a link to that um, at our uh, podcast uh, Twitter account, which is at uh, FOTG uh, podcast. Um, and uh, that's all we've got out there so far. So we're working on it. We're working. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. Thank you so much. It was uh, great to talk to both of you and uh, look forward to being on uh, Steve's show on Sunday. Oh, yeah. Thank Please. you, Josh. No problem. Yeah, thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. <laughs>